So we're going to be in Hebrews 12. We've been working our way through Hebrews, not necessarily orderly, but we've been getting, getting to most of it. <clears throat> 12, 18 through 29 is what we're going to be look, looking at today. So 12, and we'll all start out with reading Hebrews 12, 18 through 21. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and to burn with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And in so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. And so this isn't the mountain. So he's, so the writer of Hebrews is talking to Christians and, and those that were inclined to go back to Judaism because it, it, was, it made life easier for them. They wouldn't have to undergo persecution. They thought, well, it's almost the same thing. It's just minus Jesus. That's pretty close, right? And he's saying, no, 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 this is completely different. It's not that same mountain that, that it, it, you know, Mount Sinai where the Old Testament covenant was ratified. This is something completely different. And he starts out with showing what things were like back then. And so uh, go ahead and keep your finger here, but we're going to take a look at Exodus real fast. So the things of the Exodus 19 and 20. So he says um, that <clears throat> the mountain that might be touched is close enough to put physical hands on. Um, and what we're going to see in Exodus is they had to put up barriers to make sure that people didn't break through because if they got too close to God, they would have died. And so Moses had to put up barriers. And the burned with fire, there was blackness, and, and a, which is a stormy gloom, and darkness, and a tempest, which is a sudden storm or a whirlwind. And so here's what it looks like in Exodus 19, verses 2 through uh, 13. And we're going to skip all, all, all carry us along with the verse. For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped before the mountain. And then Moses went up to God, and then there's some interaction there. Um, <clears throat> uh, therefore, verse 5, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses brought those, those words back. And then in verse 8, all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the words of uh, the people to the Lord. And um, then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people, consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let, let them wash their clothes. And then on the uh, let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day I will come down upon the Mount Sinai in sight of all the people. Verse 12, you shall set bounds for all the people around, saying, Take heed to yourselves, you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through with an arrow. Where man or, whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they will come near to the mountain. And then Moses went back down the mountain. And then verse 16, Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet and that was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. <clears throat> now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. It smoke, its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai. So the, the Lord hadn't even come down yet. The blackness and darkness and smoke and earthquake and trembling of the people, that was just in preparation for the Lord to come down upon the mountain. And then the Lord, verse 20, he came down upon Mount Sinai. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at, um, at the Lord, and many of them perish. And so he did that. And then he gives them the Ten Commandments in chapter 20, verses uh, all the way through verses uh, 1 through uh, 20 or so. And then in verses um, 18 through 21, let's see. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightnings, uh, lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for the Lord has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. 
So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where the Lord was. And so that's what it looked like in the ratification of the first covenant. Pretty scary, huh? Characterized by darkness and terror and an exhortation to stay away. Why? Because God is powerful. He was showing his power. He's awesome. He's, with the breath of his mouth, is all it took for Mount Everest to, to, to force itself up to its 29,000 feet and for the depths of the ocean to push down to their 35,000 feet. From a word of his mouth, just a word, the heavens were formed. Our sun that's 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit was one of billions that got flung out into the sky with one word of his mouth. And the hottest one's 100,000 degrees Fahrenheit, they say today. God is powerful, and he is, so the people have to stay away. Why? Because he's uncontrollable. He's not contained. He will not be controlled. And that makes him dangerous. It makes him terrifying to people like us. In Job 38, after, after, after Job has some words that come near to accusing God of wrongdoing, God says, God puts Job in his, in his place, and he says, <clears throat> Hold on, I missed it, Job. And God, God puts Job in his place. And he says, where were you when I did all these things? 38, 1 through 35, we're not going to read all of it. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Sounds pretty familiar, right? The tempest, the world. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it to measure it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who had laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for glory? Who shut the sea in its doors lest it, or when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment a thick darkness its swaddling band? Verse 12, have you commanded the morning since your days began? Verse 16, have you entered the springs of the sea? Verse 17, have the gates of death been revealed to you? Verse 18, have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? In verse 19, have you entered the treasury of snow? In verse 20, and it he, and he goes on and on. God is uncontrollable. The slightest fraction of his power is so overwhelming to mankind that just the look from his countenance will bring the, bring the proudest man to humility in Job 40, verses 9. Have you an arm like God, or can you thunder with a voice like his? If so, then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor, and array yourself with glory and beauty. Disperse the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Tread the wicked in their place. The slightest glimpse from the Lord. And so God saying, you have to stay away from me. I'm, I'm powerful. I am not going to be controlled by you. And if you don't stay away, you're going to die. He's telling them that for their own good, lest they be consumed in a second. God wanted the people to obey him out of love. Look at everything he did for them. Was, weren't the ten plagues done out of love to bring his people tenderly out of oppression? Wasn't the Red Sea party done out of love? But if the people won't obey him out of love, then the next best thing is that they do not approach him out of fear. Exodus 20, 20, Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people had to stay away also because God is holy. All of his ways are holy and righteous and just. He's the standard of righteousness. And anything that deviates from his path or his is, is unrighteous and, and, and it's evil. Anytime we think that God isn't good or his judgment isn't just, or his balance isn't true. In those times, we've deceived ourselves. Our, our own heart has deceived us into thinking that our justice is better than God's justice. He's the standard of justice by which all other judgments have to be measured. Even if the entire world voted for abortion, even if every single person alive voted for abortion, it still wouldn't make it right. It's wrong in God's eyes. Even if it has the support of every president, every justice, every sovereign, it makes no difference. The standard of justice and holiness and righteousness is set with God, not with people. He's the only one who's truly good. The only one who's, who can define good because of, because of that. All other understandings of what good is are corrupt and false and presumptuous. Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and who call good evil. Who put darkness for light 
and light for darkness and bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Those who say this evil thing, it's not evil, it's good. Woe to those people, it says in Isaiah. Woe to those who call their own version of evil good. Whether you call it abortion or gay pride or whatever it is that you think it is, if it doesn't line up with the scriptures, it's not good. And woe unto that person who says that it is. He's the standard of holiness. He's holy to the core. There's never anything that's done by him that isn't purely holy. The, the, Isaiah 6 talks about how there's two angels that, that overshadow the mercy seat in heaven. And one of them is, is on this end and one's on that end. And they cry out to one another and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And they cry so loud that it shakes the pillars in heaven. Because only God can be described as holy, and he gets described that three times. In Habakkuk 1, 13, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. And, and he shows no partiality. He judges according to each one's work in 1 Peter 1, 17. And even when his own son took sin upon his own self, even at that, God had to look away. God the Father had to look away. If he didn't show partiality for sin upon his own son, why would he show partiality for sin upon you or me? The people had to stay away also because man is not holy. It shows the depth of the fall of mankind. As a carnal person, Isaiah says in Isaiah 64, 6, our righteousness is like filthy deeds, or, or like filthy rags. That's our best deeds done on the best day of our life. That's, that doesn't even come. That doesn't even count the sin. How about those times when, when we actually put forth our hands to do something evil? How putrid is that to the Lord? And then we do so many of those things. We do wrong so often. And in Matthew 18, it talks about that as if we owed the Lord ten thousand talents. And I did a little math. That's 2 million pounds of gold today worth 1.3 billion. Would you have 1.3 billion in your pocket to buy off God for a sin? That's the disparity of how spiritually impoverished we are compared to God's holiness. So the people hadn't been taught the ways of the Lord. Their hearts were not turned to the Lord. They were steeped in sin. They weren't sanctified. And God was saying, look, if you come any closer, you're going to die. Please don't come any closer. If you're not going to love me, at least fear me. There were idolaters. They clung to pagan idols. Amos 5.20, 25. You also carried Sukkot, a pagan deity, your, who is your god, and Chiyun, another pagan deity, and your idols and the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. And Molech, it says, in Renfan, the god Renfan in Acts 7.43, so the people had to stay away because, also because the way into God's presence hadn't been made manifest. Hebrews 9, 8, the Holy Spirit indicating that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest where the first tabernacle was still standing. Christ's blood had not been sprinkled in heaven yet. And so and sin had not been put away yet. It had been atoned for temporarily by the blood of bulls and goats, but had not been taken away until Christ showed up. And at that point, it, it, was, it was taken away. So the people had to stay away at the ratification of the Old Testament, of the Old Covenant, because God is powerful and awesome and, and terrible and uncontrollable and terrifying. And he's holy and he shows no partiality. And man is not holy and there was no way into God's presence back then. <clears throat> and that's also what it looks like <clears throat> when somebody today tries to approach God without, <clears throat> without the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. When an unholy, idolatrous sinner tries to come to, to, to God by his own righteousness, and if, and if you've ever done this, if you've tried this, then you know what this is like. If you've ever tried to approach God without the sprinkling of Christ, the sprinkling of the blood of Christ, <clears throat> so others may think that Others may think you're a good Christian, but your mind brings to re remembrance sins, and your conscience testifies that you're an enemy of God. And, I know because this is this is what it's this is what my experience was like. There were I spent ten years running away from God because of, because of this. Three times during my middle school years, I tried to I, I tried to go to God's word and, I, and but I wasn't doing it under the blood, the sprinkling of Jesus Christ. And for, and three times I walked away, having him, having God spoken to me, conviction upon me that, that it seemed like I couldn't escape. It seemed like there was no way, and I was and I was doomed to doomed to hell. I was struck with the terror of the Lord. I couldn't sleep. I trembled in fear. I, <clears throat> I, I couldn't 
rid myself of the thought of hell. I'd hide under the bed until I, until I fell asleep, and then finally, a couple days later, I'd forget about it enough to where I could, you know, get regular sleep at night. And all I knew is that's a scary book. Don't open that book. It's it is terrifying. So I ran away from him just like the Israelites did. When hearing his word, I just didn't believe it. It couldn't sink in that God loved me because when I opened it, he seemed to hate me. And so that kept me away from the church. It kept me out of the Bible for 10 years. For 10 years, I was terrified of the Lord, terrified. And as long as I could keep my thoughts about something that wasn't God, then I could finally have a little bit of peace. But as soon as the thought of God came back into my mind, then I was in torment again. And this is what it felt like. Anger and rage and terror and fear. and Because I, because I was approaching without the blood of Jesus Christ being sprinkled on, on myself. Hebrews 7, 18 through 19. For on the one hand, there is an annulling, of the, an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, the bringing in of a better hope did, through which we draw near to God. So the first covenant was stay away. The, sec the second covenant is draw near. Back to Hebrews. Verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. <clears throat> so you haven't come to that earthly mountain where there's blackness and darkness and tempest and terror, where people are kept away from, from God lest they be consumed in a moment. That mountain scene was only a copy and a shadow of the real thing that's happening in heaven. And that's what we've come to is the real thing that's happening in heaven. So it's clear that God had a better thing in mind for us in Hebrews 7, 19. A better hope, a better priest, a better covenant, better promises, better tabernacle. 7, 19. For the, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing of, you know, of a better hope did. And so what we see here on earth is, and what we see here on, old, on earth is only just a small portion, just a teeny little fraction of the real thing that's going on in heaven. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. So the book of Hebrews describes it for us just a little bit, as do a couple other places. And so we're going to piece together some of these and, and, and ask that the Lord would reveal to us what's really going on in heaven, that he would show us those things that eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard. Verse 24, you've come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Because you've come to Jesus, by virtue of that, he sprinkled you with his own blood, and by that we draw near to God. Verse Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near to God with the true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And in 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Christ is our salvation. He's our only access into heaven. Without Christ, there is no access into heaven. And so it compares Christ with Abel. Abel is probably the most pure, faultless person identified in the Old Testament. The Bible doesn't say a single thing negative about Abel, and it says one thing that's really great about Abel, that he brought him as the, the first of his flock and of, and of the fat. There's so much that could be said about that. He seems to have known that, that he seems to have a heart after God. He brought, this, he brought his first and his best. He didn't bring the leftovers. And then he seemed to understand that that he was a sinner and he needed a sacrifice for sin. That's why he didn't just put, put the whole animal on. He, he brought the blood. The animal was killed for him. He didn't bring an offering. He brought a sacrifice. There's so much, so much that could be said about, about Abel. But about Christ, there's also similarly no negative testimony, but there's a thousand positive testimonies, 10,000 that are recorded in Scripture if you, if you look at them closely. All without sin, 
without mishandling a single conversation, without a character flaw, without even a hint of wrong motives. Abel's blood cries from the ground as he was unjustly murdered, as his cries from the ground as innocence. He was innocent of the great transgression, but Christ's blood is even more perfect than that of Abel. Not just innocent of the great transgression, but pure, completely pure, completely holy, innocent of any transgression in thought or word or deed. And that, and that blood was sprinkled over you and me, not here on earth, in heaven. And as the mediator of the new covenant, Christ our high priest, priest he perfectly suits us, he perfectly fits us. Would you turn to 7.24, Hebrews 7.24. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore he is able also to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, or innocent, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. So what makes him so fitting for us? That he's holy. Just as God the Father is holy, so Christ is holy. His internal constitution is just holiness. He hates lawlessness and loves holiness in Hebrews 1.9. He's, he's harmless or innocent. He's innocent in, in, with no sin at all. Nothing that would incur guilt of his own. He's undefiled, he's unstained from sin. He's separate from sinners, not classed with the common people, not classed as, 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 as one who needs to be sprinkled or sanctified. And thank the Lord that Christ is holy and that he's innocent and undefiled, separate from all sin. That, this isn't just a nice thing to imagine. It's a necessary thing to certify. People today, it's, it's popular for people to think that, that, that Jesus had sin, that he was just like everybody else. It's, it soothes the people's miserable conscience they know that the wrath of God is upon them, and by pointing at Christ and, and attributing some sort of sin to him, they feel like they can um, get away from God's wrath maybe a little bit. But what they're actually doing is cutting off their own hope of salvation. They don't, they don't realize that their false comfort has become their own downfall. And believing Christ has sin, they forfeited all hope of salvation. If Christ had sin, then he wouldn't be innocent, he wouldn't be um, undefiled, he wouldn't be holy. And if he's not holy, then he's not able to stand before God the Father for you or me. And, in, in, and if somebody who's, who, if somebody who, if nobody can stand before God and the Father, between, between God the Father and you or me, then we're back to the Old Testament covenant where there's only fear, where there's no salvation for, for anybody. If Christ had even the slightest spot of sin on him, but he was the perfect Lamb of God, no stain on his spiritual garment anywhere, and because Christ is holy, he's able to, he's the one who's, he's, he's qualified to stand before God the Father. He's able to come before him and mediate on your behalf and on my behalf. And he's willing to plead your case. He loves you enough to where he'll do that for you. In the old covenant, you or I wouldn't have spoken at all. Did God really ask for input at that mountain? No, it was God thundering. But in the, in the new covenant, Christ comes and pleads your case before God the Father. He'll speak for you. And he's able to save to the uttermost, completely to the end. Those two come to God through him. And so because he's holy and innocent and undefiled, he can be the mediator between us and a God who's powerful and uncontrollable and holy and, and separate from sinners. And so God has this better thing for us today since Christ came and on. That's what it says in Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. <clears throat> but, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he also is mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. Better covenant, better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for the second. But finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will, I will write them, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, 
and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, none of them his brother, saying, Know the Lord, like, change, like, do this in order so you can know the Lord. Act in this way. Follow these, you know, this regime. <clears throat> but for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So Christ makes us into a new creation. He writes on our hearts and on our minds his laws and so we can walk in them. And so no more do we have to be pushed away in fear, but we can draw near to him in love. And yes, there's still a fear of the Lord that we're exhorted to in the New Testament, that we don't transgress against him, that we don't, um, that we don't push the boundary of who he is. He's still the awesome, powerful, majestic God who does bring wrath upon the sons of disobedience. And so we, and, and sometimes it does take fear. If, if we're not going to obey out of love, then the fear of the Lord is the next thing to keep us from, from harm. And through Christ, you've come to this heavenly scene. We might be just a few here on earth, but we come to something so much bigger and grander than you could ever imagine. So much more glorious than heart could even endure. You may not see it, but if, if Christ has sprinkled you with his blood, then you've entered into that heavenly scene. And verse 12, 12, 23, you've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to a heavenly mountain, not an earthly mountain, the heavenly Jerusalem. This is the heavenly gathering where, the, where, where there's a host of heavenly angels that gather together and our heavenly Father is there. And, and we're brought near by the blood of Christ to that place, to the Father. The heavenly mountain where God's city rests, where God's throne is placed. This is the pinnacle of pinnacles. It's the grandest height of glory. It's the epicenter of even heaven around which all else is focused. It's where all the hosts of heaven and those who, including those who preceded us to glory, plus an innumerable company of angels all gather together to give glory to the Lord Most High who sits on his throne there. Would you hold your finger here and turn to Isaiah 68? There's some neat things in Isaiah 6. I'm sorry, Psalm 68. Psalm 68. <clears throat> Psalm 68, verses 7 and 8. Oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel, in verse 8. <clears throat> and then in verse 16. Why do you feel with envy, you mountains and many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. So it's talking about Mount Zion. Mount Zion, where God wants to dwell. This, this is the same place where we've come to. And then it's also the same place that Exodus 25 talks about where, where well, Isaiah 6 talks about where the, the two angels are yelling from across one to another. They're the... They're the the cherubim that cover the mercy seat. And then in Ezekiel, if you'll turn with me to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, 14 through 16. This is also where it appears that Lucifer was one of those two angels. Hey, what it looks like is Lucifer was one of those two that would cry, holy, holy, holy to the other one. The whole, whole of the earth is full of his glory, and they cry that back and forth, and it looks like Lucifer was one of those two. It says in Ezekiel 28, 14, you are the anointed cherub, this is talking about Lucifer, you are the anointed cherub who covers the covering cherub. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. Those would be angels. You were perfect in your ways from the days that you were created until iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. So this is the mountain of God, and Satan got cast out of that place. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. And it's also where Lucifer mounted his jealous assault on the throne of God, and that's in Isaiah 14. In 12 through 13, I'll go ahead and read it. 14, 12 through 13. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Those are the angels. I will sit 
also on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, that's the highest place, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. And so this is where, where we've come to, is this, where there's this, the mountain of God, the new Jerusalem, where an innumerable company of angels are there, where Satan was Lucifer before that, he was one of the anointed cherub that was calling back and forth, where he mounted his attack upon God to try to take over heaven and where he got thrust down because that holy hill is the place where God inhabits. That's where he wants to inhabit. That's where his throne is at. So you and I have come to that place. Verse 23, you've come to an innumerable company of angels, a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God. The full number is not given because it's innumerable, it can't be counted. Verse 23, you've come to the general assembly. And so what it looks like is, there's not a whole lot of detail in this, but it looks like the general assembly is the saints of old, plus the saints who are alive today, whose names are, are registered in heaven, but they're not there yet. Verse 23, the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. The firstborn is Christ. It says, it calls him the firstborn in several places in the New Testament. Firstborn from the dead, Revelations 1 5, Colossians 1 15 18. And these, so these are the living people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They're registered in heaven even though they're not there yet. Revelation 20 15. And anyone not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life was cast into the lake of fire. And Philippians, and I urge you, true companion, help those women who labor with me in the gospel and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the Book of Life. And to God, the judge of all. You've been brought near to God, the judge, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ's sacrifice allows you to draw near. Nobody is drawn near to God apart from Christ's sacrifice. And do you call on the... And so because of that, you have the privilege, and I do, to come to him in boldness to approach the throne of grace, and then in meekness and humility to make our petitions known before him, with thanksgiving. And do you call on the Father? First Peter 1.17 Then conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear because he is mighty and powerful and he is not to be trifled with. Verse 23 You've come to the spirits of just men made perfect. These appear to be the just or the righteous men and women from the old covenant. Their spirits have now been made perfect. That's the 5048, the word the, the, in Strong's that Paul hadn't even hadn't even um, attained to. So the, that's that's the thing that happens when somebody's trans, translated to heaven, when they cross the river and, 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 and Christ brings them to heaven. And Paul hadn't even attained to that, but these are the people who have attained to that. So they've already the Old Testament saints or saints in this testament who've already made it up to heaven, who've preceded us to glory. And in Psalm 68, 17, it says, Christ has ascended on high. He brought out those who were in captivity. He, he led captivity captives. What that is, is those who were in captivity, he led them out. Just like if, just what captivity is, is when you lead somebody out of cap, out, into captivity, you take them out of their city and bring them somewhere else. So he went to those who were captive, and he led them in captivity to bring them somewhere else, which would, which would be to heaven. So, what, what are the implications of all this? The ratification of the first covenant was, was filled with terror and darkness and, and, and an exhortation to stay away because God is powerful and mighty. He's uncontrollable and holy and we are not. And God hasn't changed. But now because of Christ, we have access into his presence. We've been, we've been changed. And so we can walk in newness of life. So we can be accepted by him. And, and, because, and, and so this doesn't leave us with less responsibility. This leaves us with more responsibility. We're not less culpable today. We're more culpable today. As fearful as the Old Testament, Old Covenant was, they were only dealing with the shadow of, of the heavenly things. We're dealing with the heavenly things themselves, with the real things. And so who is the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn? Christ is the is, firstborn is Christ, the Church of Christ. And the General Assembly is all those who are called together because of him. 
those who have gained a good testimony, those who gave a good testimony of Jesus Christ in their generation and have now come to glory, those who are in process of giving their testimony will be welcomed into glory later as long as they don't look back. <clears throat> and so we, we, we look at the Old Testament saints through these pages and we say, I, I, I see how God interacted with them. I see that. I, I wish that he would do that in my life. I wish he would do that here and now. But each one of them had the opportunity to say the same thing. Joseph, he would look back on those that preceded him, and he could say, well, I wish God was involved in my life today, but you know what? He was involved in Joseph's life that day. And each one of them looked back to those who were before them, and they could have said the same thing. But God was just as involved in their life as he was in any of the preceding generations, and it's the same thing here today. As much as you or I look here and see, and, and we could say, oh, I wish God was involved in my life like this. <clears throat> he is. He's just that, he, he's the same level of involvement to everybody who calls upon him, who, who draws near to him, who wants him to be involved in their life. Only a few believed that God was involved in their lives, and so only a few lived as if God was. And so that's why only a few were written about. But, but God's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's just as available today as he was back then. He's just as willing to be involved in your life as he was back then. And for some of these, the scripture records their story. Not for all of them. There's so many that, that scripture wouldn't be able to record all of them. Some love not their lives unto the death, and now they're seated with Christ. And for the grand and unknown saints... You or, you or I probably won't know their names until you make it into heaven and then, and then until you cross the Jordan. Because for the believer, this is only, you only pass through the shadow of death. It's not even the real thing. It looks like death from this side of the river, but when you cross through it, it's just the shadow of death. And these saints are most certainly there. And if we could see heaven open up, if we could just catch a glimpse then we'd see the church of the firstborn. Those who are up there, as part of the general assembly, we'd see those that are up there already. We'd lift up our eyes, we could look and see who's there. Would you look? When Peter, James, and John were on Mount Transfiguration, they didn't have to ask who those two men were that were with Jesus, they just knew it's Moses and Elijah. They just knew, and somehow you'll be able to recognize people, and I'll be able to recognize people too. You'll just know who they are. So do you recognize Abraham and Sarah? Like if you could see, if, if we all could see up there, could see this general assembly of all those that have passed on before us, that are called together, you'd see Abraham and Sarah. They're the ones that are laughing. Smiling, grinning from ear to ear, laughing and getting us in their old age. They have something to laugh about. Who would have thought that they could have a child at 90 to 100 years old? And do, do you see Moses? He's the, he's the meekest one that's ever lived. His face is on the ground. He's holding the staff in his hand. Instead of reacting in anger, he'd always just go to prayer. And the staff in his hand struck fear into all of Egypt. It parted the Red Sea and lifted the army of Israel to victory and it shepherded that wandering band through the wilderness. And do you see David? Do you recognize him? He's the fair and ruddy one. He's smaller than the rest, but he's got his sling and his harp in his hand. Forgotten by his own family, but remembered by God. Do you see the three who are together in the flames? That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They stood for Christ when all others bowed down before the golden image in their day. But the fire could not hurt them. And then Daniel, do you see him? He's a man of prayer. He's one who's petting the lion. Look at Jeremiah. He's got tears in his eyes because he preached his heart out. And nobody would listen. And he knew that it was going to be for their destruction if they didn't listen. Then Mary Magdalene, look at her. She's got her jar of ointment. But it's empty because she poured it all on Christ's head. And he refilled her by, by, with joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory. And she was 
that she was filled with love for Christ and faithfulness unto death. And look at Peter preaching boldly. Look at, look at Paul writing diligently. Look at, look at John Bunyan and George Whitfield and Spurgeon and Eric Little. Each of them was faithful to death. Each one of them has lessons that we can learn from. And each one of their lives is a call to Christ, the once for all sacrifice, and an exhortation to holy living. They're all part of the great cloud of witnesses that you and I have come to. And then look at Christ. He's the grandest of them all. So grand that it makes a grown man weep, so pure that it breaks the heart of even the hardest sinner, so glorious that everyone who truly beholds the cross cannot even look away. There's more love in the toenail of his small toe than in all the rest of humanity combined. He's the most beautiful of all. He's the fairest among 10,000. The lily of the valley. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He's the one, in, he's the one who's in the midst of the throne, in the midst of the elders, it says in Revelation 5, 6, that a lamb as though it had been slain. These are all part of the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn. What are they doing? They're waiting until all things are put under Christ's feet, at which time they'll reign with Christ forever and ever. And what do you think they're doing also between now and then? I'll bet that if we could look closely, we could see their eyes, I'll bet you that they're watching you, and they're watching me. Why do I say that? <clears throat> because... We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. In, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, so great a cloud of witnesses. They're part of that great cloud. So we, we look at history, we look at the Bible and say, oh, I wish God would be involved in my life. And the offer's on the table. He will be if you want him to be. Christ did everything that he's going to do. It's up to you and me to approach God now. In the Old Testament, they couldn't do that. The old, the old covenant was you stay away from me. The new covenant is you draw near me by the blood of Jesus Christ. Friend, God is interacting with us today in the same way for anyone who's willing to engage with him. And then what you read about others in the, in the Old Testament or maybe other Christian uh, biographies, maybe somebody will read that about you. Do you think that Christ is less involved today than he'd been deceived? He's just as involved today as he was back then. And now is your race of faith. And your race has begun. And are you still standing at the starting line? Run, man, run. Run for Christ. Don't you know your days are numbered? And they're passing you by. What are you doing? If you're faithful, then you'll take your place next to those who are in the stands, who run the race successfully. And then you'll watch and you'll cheer for those others in the following generations. But if you're not faithful, then your name will be scorned for a thousand generations, just like Judas Iscariot. Will you take your place next to Jim Elliot? When, then, when you refuse sanctification or to walk in holiness? And as you look down the track, you see that the path isn't easy, it's difficult, there's hurdles, there's pits. It's going to be difficult. No, no race has ever been won with any extra strength left in the body. If you think you're going to finish your race with extra strength, you're wrong. It's going to take everything you've got. Trials and tribulations, yeah, there's hurdles. There's hurdles on that on, on that track that you're that you're gonna, that you're running. There's hurdles, there are difficulties that have to be overcome. You can't go around, you have to learn to overcome them. And so many people are brought to all stop at one or, or, or any multitude of these hurdles. They've stopped so many from their stride and so many never even make it back onto the track. They never finish their race because of that. And then there's pits. Pits to for you to fall into along the way, to get you to stumble and trip and fall. Some are filled with water or even lions to get you to stop running the race to quit the faith. And you'll be tested along, along the route. There'll be times when God even tests you, but he'll never give you more than you can handle. 
But with the temptation, he'll make a way to escape. And then along the way, there's things for you to do. There's good works. Good works that are prepared, prepared for you beforehand that you should walk in them. So be about the Father's business. And then there's these meandering side paths that are, that are littered everywhere. Spiritual idleness or, or non-productive, non-productive lures that the temptation to stop and take a detour from diligently following Christ. To, to go and smell the roses and see what this world has to offer. To chase after something that maybe isn't bad, but it's also not Christ. There's so many pursuits that have kept Christ's people... There, I'm sorry, there's so many pursuits that have kept people out of Christ's kingdom. But there's nobody who's focused on Christ who hasn't made it into the kingdom. And if you had ears to hear, and if you or I had ears to hear, then as the crowd watches... Is that great assembly in heaven? Is that cloud of witnesses watches? You'd hear the crowd roar to life as you overcome a hurdle of temptation. Something that you had tripped over and stumbled over before, now you've learned how to overcome it. Having demonstrated that your love for Christ is greater, and the crowd comes to life and they roar as you do that. And they sit in dismay as you stop and play tiddlywinks. They say, what is he doing? And when you turn to sin, they groan, oh, how could they? Don't you realize you have unprecedented access to the giver of all comfort? And then they sigh when you, when you or I reject Christ's commands, to not obey Christ's commands. To not show up for practice is the same thing as showing up and not doing what the coach says. Those who reject Christ's commands. Look at Judas Iscariot, he fell there. Ananias and Sapphira, they fell there. Lot's wife fell there. Balaam fell there. People who had opportunity, tremendous opportunity, and ruined it. And see the crowd focus their gaze and jump to their feet when you proclaim the glory of Christ and his gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, things which angels desire to look into. It's not popular in a wicked and adulterous generation, but there is nothing more popular in the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn in Heaven. Heaven is watching you, and so are the little ones who are around here. So are other people who are watching and learning. They're going to emulate you one day. And others will look at your life, and they'll either find it encouraging and say, that's what I want to do, that's, that's what I want to be. Or they'll look at you and say, don't be like them. This is where they quit the race. What are later gener gener will later generations find you in that crowd? Will you join those stands? Not without effort, you won't. Not many of, how many of those in the stands have, have already gave themselves to the pursuit of worldly things? None of them. None of those in those stands have given themselves to the pursuit of worldly things. They chased after Christ. They followed Christ. They loved God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. How few are in those stands compared with the numbers that began the race in their day? Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are scattered along the road, but only few make it to the stands. Many ran, but only a few ran their race and finished well. And, and enter the General Assembly. Who has begun their race? Who is making the turn? Those who trust in Christ. Those who truly believe what Christ spoke. Who are seeking to please Him, who have fallen upon the rock of Christ. And their lives in this world are irreparably broken. Ruined from the pursuit of sins or past pleasures. Those who have found that Christ is the river of living water, the eternal hope to which they claim, their joy and rejoicing, these are the ones that you can't pry from the, from, the, from the foot of the cross. They've got their arms wrapped around it so tightly that you'll never get it away from them. Those who have found that there's nothing in this filthy world polluted with sin that satisfies them any longer, those are the ones who started the race. Therefore, verse 25, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape, who, 
who refused him who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? It's not that God used to speak, it's that he's still speaking. Every time we read his word, he speaks. Every time his word is preached in truth, he speaks. Every time we go to prayer with an open heart, he speaks. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he is promising, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, so that the things which cannot be, sh be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. He's saying... <clears throat> Just like there was a shaking on that mountain back then, at the ratification of the first covenant, there's another shaking that's going to happen. And it's going to shake everything that can be shaken. Every earthly structure, every misplaced priority, everything that can be shaken, even in heaven, everything will be shaken. And the only things that will remain standing are those that are unshakable. Which is all those things that are based on the rock of Jesus Christ, our faith, our hope, our joy, our peace, the works that Christ has done through us, everything else will be shaken. Just like Jesus said when the disciples said, look at all these grand stones, all these grand <clears throat> buildings. And Jesus said, every single stone will, will be thrown down. Every single stone in your life or my life or in anyone's life, in any, any of this world that's not built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ must come down. It will be shaken. And if that's the case, then what manner of person ought you or I to be in, in all holiness? Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and God's fear. Grace is God's, God's guidance and empowerment to live God's way. It's not the mushy, you can do anything you want kind of garbage. It's lasciviousness. That's not God's grace. That's lasciviousness. God's grace is his power to obey him. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. If, if your grace doesn't include godly fear, then it is not biblical grace. For our God is a consuming fire. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I has not seen nor ear have heard the things that have entered, or neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared, prepared for those that love him but he has made them known to us through his spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you for <clears throat> this word that you've put in your great book. We ask that you would let it change us, that we would see things differently than ever before, that we would see the resp how responsible we are, even more responsible than those that trembled in fear at the quaking of that mountain in Mount Sinai but that we've come to the New Jerusalem, to Mount Zion, to the city of God, where you're seated on your throne, and our only access there is because of Christ's blood. Lord, let us not take one day for granted, not one hour, not one minute. Let us, let us waddle on the track. You gave us such great commands when you said, to pray, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. If we prayed that and meant that there would be so much harm that we would avert. Lord, keep us on your track. Help us to diligently pursue Christ. Christ's holiness without which no man will see the Lord. Thank you for this people. I'm so thankful, O oh Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Christ. In Jesus' name.